It's a strange world that we live in, and the future isn't what it used to be. We've always had such an infinite capacity for creation and compassion and joy, but also for rage and cruelty. You see, I think your life and everything is a non-linear system. We understand linear systems, cause and effect, positive correlation and negative correlation. The problem with a non-linear system is that the interactions quickly become too complex. No one remains one person. And what if a conversation could change the way that you think about yourself and the world? And what if everything that you held to be true was somehow, in some way, wrong? I'm Dr. Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. Okay, time here at 94.9 Main FM for Deep Trouble. And once again, it's Steve Charman with Dr. Mark Halloran. So you'll be interviewing Dr. Susan Hewitt-Bell. And the focus will be on domestic violence. Yes, we're specifically talking about violent men. Dr. Sue Hewitt-Bell is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney and is recognised as a leader in domestic and family violence research. So she spent almost 30 years in the domestic violence and child protection field and has conducted many studies in these areas. So she's considered to be a leading voice in the field of research around domestic violence. And I contacted her after I read an article that she wrote for the conversation in the aftermath of the murder of Hannah Clark and her children. Right. Well, Dr. Susan Ewan-Bell says in the course of the interview that we are in the middle of an epidemic, no, not COVID-19, an epidemic of domestic violence. And when you look at the statistics, it is rather frightening. I was looking at the ABC news from end of last year, and they were quoting the following statistic. One in six women has experienced physical or sexual violence by a current or former partner since the age of 15. That's 1.6 million Australian women. And on average, one woman a week yeah. is murdered by her current or former partner. It's mm-hmm. horrific. I think I touch on that in the interview. And there's something that's almost more horrific about it because it's someone that you would have intimacy with and expect to be safe and protected or protected with. And mm-hmm. so I think that's the truly terrifying thing about it. Susan talks about the deficiencies in our funding and in how that funding is used. She'll go into that in the interview, but I will say this, that in yes. 2010, the federal government, in partnership with state and territory governments, developed a 12-year national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. And almost a decade later, you know how much money has been spent on that plan? $723 million. And that's on top of the money state and territories are spending on their programs. So it's Mm. not like there hasn't been money thrown at this problem. Then Mm. why haven't we accomplished more? Well, it depends if the amount of money that's been allocated towards a problem is proportional with the problem itself, particularly with the complexity of the problem. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, Susan will be talking about that. I'll tell you one thing. After May's 2019 federal election, Mm. Liberal Senator Anne Rustin became the Social Service Minister. That made her the seventh person to oversee the national plan since Mm. 2010. That's in nine years there have been seven Social Services Ministers, including the current Prime Minister. Anyway, let's go into it. The interview Dr Mark Howland did with Dr Susan Hewitt-Bell. And I should warn people that there is some strong language in this interview. Hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Susan. So thanks very much for doing this. Yeah, no worries. So I discovered your work after you wrote an article for The Conversation in the aftermath of the murder of Hannah Clark and her children. And so I was interested what you thought we were getting wrong about domestic violence. Yeah, look, I think there are a number of things that we're getting wrong about domestic violence. 
I think, you know, we have a very fractured and a really fragmented system that has really significant problems because there's a, a really massive jurisdictional gap between, you know, federal law, which is at the level of the family law court, but at the same time, we've got child protection legislation and we've got, you know, protection orders and the criminal law, which often is used in domestic violence cases, obviously, which are at the state and territory level. So I think that women and children who are seeking safety from domestic violence have an incredibly complicated system to try and navigate. So I think that's one issue that we're getting wrong. I think also we still have a very incident-based approach to responding to victims of domestic violence or survivors of domestic violence. What I mean by that is oftentimes it takes an incident of physical assault or sexualized violence against a victim to initiate any sort of response. So I think as a result, there's less concentration on looking at the kind of patterned nature of domestic violence, which contains a lot of coercive control at the basis of it. And so women who maybe are not victims of physical assaults frequently or sexualized violence frequently, I think they can tend to get missed or they can tend to think that what's happening to them doesn't constitute domestic violence, hence they won't sort of seek help. Should I keep going? Oh, well, I was interested in what you thought was required in terms of changes at the level of jurisprudence. I know that they've trialled coercive control laws. Maybe you can speak about that in the UK and Scotland to try and reduce perpetrator offending. But I suppose I'm interested in as well that I know Jermaine Greer wrote an essay called On Rape, and she said that one of the problems was that it was still considered a crime against the state rather than a crime against an actual victim. Yeah. And, and we try to change that by bringing in victim impact statements and restorative justice. But to some extent, all violent crimes are crimes against the state. That's still how it works. So I was wondering what actually needs to change in relation to domestic violence cases. Yeah, look, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, I think I've spoken to victims of violence who feel like in their own sort of court cases, they felt that they were simply sort of witnesses to a crime as opposed to the actual victim of that crime. And they are quite surprised oftentimes when they feel like the judicial system isn't actually there to be backing them as the object of concern. So I think that that is, you know, very true. You know, Judith Herman, who's an American psychiatrist, she wrote a really famous book, Trauma and Recovery, and she wrote in that book that, you know, if you actually willfully set out to devise a legal system that was going to compound victims' trauma and kind of induce challenges, whether that PTSD or other challenges, that it would look like the system that we have. So I think, you know, we've got this system that, you know, really compounds the trauma. And I think oftentimes what victims of domestic violence experience in the private realm can actually be mirrored at the institutional level in terms of the public arena and those responses to women. So I speak to lots of victims of domestic violence who one of their major concerns is the really poor response that they received from multiple levels, whether that be in the court, whether that be from the police, whether that be from professionals, whether that be from, you know, members of the community. I think some of the headlines that came out after the tragic murder of Hannah Clark and her children also kind of expressed that still at a societal level, there's just such a lack of understanding of what's happening when there are matters of domestic violence. I know that there's been a lot of advocacy from feminists. Uh, you talk about femocrats in terms of uh, influencing legislation. And the way that the media has changed in terms of the reports of domestic violence, there's no longer reports about men who snap and things like that in relation to you know, some sort of domestic stressor. What is the problem with the way that society understands domestic violence? 
Yeah, look, I think that for lots of journalists, for example, that has changed. And I think there's been a lot of work after all the incredible work that Rosie Batty did. I think that things did seem like they were moving in the right direction. Journalistic codes of ethics about how reports should be made, what language should be used. But then I think, you know, in this instance, you know, there were still lots of headlines about him snapping. You had the police officer in Queensland who was sort of stood down from the case making a statement about we need to keep an open mind about what happened here. That really raised some eyebrows, I think, as well. Yeah, I, so I think that that just really shows what a lot of women have said to me and to lots of other people, that they still feel that there's this kind of like inherent bias where mm. in this particular crime, it's like particular excuses seem to be offered up by people who are in positions of power at the kind of, you know, the institutional levels of power. You know, yes. when you hear Pauline Hanson, mm. you know, she was also sort of openly, publicly, as a member of the Senate, actually saying, I was actually quite happy to hear Queensland police speaking in that way because it sort of shows that they're keeping an open mind and a lot of yes. men are pushed too far. And then I think the example of just even having a commission and having someone who is so openly biased and publicly made statements that kind of intimated that women lie in the context of the family law court. So I agree with you. There are lots of examples where things seem to be improving from the media standpoint but there still remains a huge amount of work to be done. Another example, just of this kind of, at an institutional sort of political level, you know, I worked for a long time in child protection. Child protection services, I think, are improving the way that they respond to families when there's domestic violence. But, you know, there's still that sort of undertone, that discourse about women who fail to protect their children. And there's still so much emphasis on sort of placing women who experience domestic violence under the microscope, assessing their parenting capacity, but not at the same time actually going back to the person that's causing the harm to children and really trying to work with them and hold them accountable. I think there's still a huge way to go in that respect. I read about what you'd written in terms of failure to protect being problematic in terms of being a version of victim blaming, which I can understand. I think that there's been a tendency towards that, like you said, a tendency to overly focus on the woman in the situation but then I think the other issue of it is that if you've got a child protection system under-resourced and they're working with a woman who's deciding to stay with an abusive partner for a myriad of complex reasons, and that puts the children at risk, they are really limited in terms of their options, aren't they? I totally agree with you about the fact that it's such a complex issue. You know, in order for a child protection worker to assist and partner with that woman and help her to be able to protect her children. It's dependent upon there being adequate women's refuges to refer yes. that woman to transitional housing, stable long-term social housing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the fact that as a community, we don't have enough of those services put in place but to me, that's another sort of failure of government and failure of the community to actually respond in a really meaningful way. It seems like we just respond in this reactive way every time there is another horrendous murder of a woman and her children. Mm -hmm. Then it gets all of the media attention. But yeah, I've done some research as well interviewing women's refuge workers, and they basically run their services on the smell of an oily rag, and they feel that they spend so much time just having to write tenders to kind of beg for their next bit of money to sustain their service that, you know, why can't we actually have a planned process where they receive recurrent funding? You know, so I think that that to me is a real failure of government and the community to take this really seriously. You're listening to the Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Dr. Sue Hewitt Bell, Senior Lecturer at the University of Sydney and a recognised leader in domestic and family violence research. I read in your work that um, the meta analysis has shown that women's refuges are essentially a key to curbing domestic violence. And you've found through your work that they're often dramatically underfunded. And this is due to a multitude of factors. One of them, which is a key one, which I think is really important, which is the corporatisation of the community sector. 
But yeah. you wrote about saying that all of these gains that were developed by the feminists and the Femocrats who advocated for policy change have been lost. And do, do you think they really have been lost? Yeah, look, I do. You know, speaking to people who work in that sector, in New South Wales anyway, you just get such a sense of despondency that it's really quite concerning. They just gave me so many examples of how this kind of like neoliberal approach where you try to use kind of business principles and bring them into the community sector just has such poor outcomes. So they really talked about specifically the issue of having competitive tendering had just resulted in the situation where all the things that we would want community services to do, you know, i.e. collaborate, work together, share their ideas, has just resulted in this situation where they feel they have to be very guarded and protectionist about their own turf. Because if they don't, then they might lose their funding in the next round of funding allocation. Yeah, and so they really had talked to me about feeling like their sort of collegiality and collaborative efforts were really so, well, In New South Wales, the people that I interviewed basically said that they were destroyed. For example, they used to meet annually at the Women's Refuge Conference. They would get together. It was an opportunity to share ideas, foster a sense of well-being as professionals. That doesn't happen anymore. I know you wrote about the going home, staying home uh, funding for women's refuges. But I wondered whether you said, look, the problem with this is that it used to be kind of a a gendered approach in terms of understanding like uh, women's studies and gender issues. Um, It's become gender blind. But I wondered whether it was really that it was gender blind and and just that the sector was underfunded, corporatised, bureaucratic and inefficient. All of those things, yes, Yes. were things that participants in the research that I did said to me, but they Mm. also sort of said that in that round of funding, to get their funding to continue their refuges, they actually had to prove that they would be able to offer a generic homelessness service. So that generic homelessness service had to be available to any person deemed to be homeless. So that effectively sort of was very challenging Mm. for a traditional feminist model that was working, you know, they had workers who were very specialized in working with victims of domestic violence and their children. So suddenly it was like, okay, well, no, you now need to kind of work with a man who's been on the streets for a very long time because of substance abuse issues. So on the one hand, they sort of spoke about how it was very unrealistic to expect them to have that sort of generic range of skills across multiple complex problems, but more so they were sort of talking about how this was actually very scary for their clients who felt that they were actually seeking refuge in a place that was housed with other women who had experienced similar problems that they had and that had employees who really very much understood the issues surrounding domestic violence. So the problem seems to be that when you have a tragedy And these tragedies occur all too often, uh, like the murder of Hannah Clark and her children, that the politicians at a state and federal level come out and talk and say the right things in terms of what should occur with jurisprudence and all that sort of thing. But very little seems to happen at the funding level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was reading something in the paper that a woman's refuge worker had said she attended the vigil in Canberra. And, you know, she said, look, this is really great that so many people are standing here holding candles. But we want to see some real action, like stand every time a woman dies and say all the things that are comforting to the community and perhaps comforting to her family and loved ones. Like, actually treat this as a public health epidemic, which it is. You know, we, we're we so sort of focused right now on the coronavirus. I'm not saying we shouldn't be, but we've also got like a massive global epidemic that is violence against women. You know, you've got the Australian Human Rights Commission, which stated that the single greatest manifestation of human rights abuse is domestic violence. We know it's a leading cause of homelessness for people in Australia. So why are we not acting? I mean, and you look at in New South Wales how quickly things were able to be mobilized when a young man was king hit in King's Cross. That you led know, that, to lockout that laws. In, that resulted in very fast action, sweeping mm. changes, taken hugely seriously. Why is it that women are king hit every day 
in their home. That seems to be tolerated. So this is an important point in terms of the level of jurisprudence, which I've been interested in. And I've spoken to lawyers about this. I've worked in the Victims Assistance Program. And there is a difference in this, isn't there? If I was to assault someone in the way that a lot of domestic violence assaults occur, if I was to do that as to a stranger on the street, I would be facing a fairly significant prison sentence. If we're yeah. talking about strangulation, if we're talking about battery, but this occurs yeah. all the time. And I just don't think that we take it seriously at that level for some reason. There seems to be some almost sort of psychic block around this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, that's where I think kind of sociologically about what is it about our, the hegemonic assumptions that we hold about the place of women in society, the place of men in society. So for Mm. me, the criminal justice system is one part of the equation for a certain percentage of batterers. But I think, you know, we also have to start to think so much more about prevention at an early age. What are we teaching boys and girls about relationships and what are we teaching them about respect? And, you know, how are we trying to sort of break down some of those ridiculous old fashioned sexist assumptions that we have about, you know, how women should behave and how men should behave. So I think there's just so much work to be done there. You've worked therapeutically, I think, and and in terms of your research with men who use all of the forms of violence, physical, psychological, emotional and financial abuse. And I just wondered what you discovered about those men. Yeah, look, I mean, what I discovered about those men is that I think there's a proportion of those men that could be invited to go on a journey to change their attitudes and their behaviors. I think we need to think carefully, however, about if we're going to fund an increase in men's behavior change programs or in programs for uh, to improve the fathering of domestically violent men. We need to make sure that that's actually not at the expense of programs that are set up to help women and children who bear the brunt of this violence. But I certainly think it seems to me that there is an opportunity for some men yes. to leverage their kind of ethic of wanting to be a good father as a kind of foot in the door to start to think about breaking down that attitude that we seem to have in society that you can be a good father and be abusing your wife. Mm. You know, I think that we need to have some programs that really challenge that belief system and really get men who use violence to think about, well, what kind of father do you want to be? How do your children see you? What needs to change in order to be an ethical, responsible man? We have facilitated a program called Caring Dads, which is considered to be a sort of promising program in this area. But I think that every time I get to the end of facilitating that program, I think, geez, it would be great to almost have like a similar uh, program, maybe like in Alcoholics Anonymous or something, where now you hand these men over to other men in the community who are actually performing masculinity in a respectful way. In a, they're being like generative parents who are caring and nurturing loving, respectful to their children and their partners. So I think there's a really long way that we have to go in actually raising the profile of fathers as being really essential to making changes for their children. Because without a doubt, most of the men that, say, come to the Caring Dads program, when they talk about their fathers, it's kind of either that their fathers were completely absent or that their fathers were highly abusive. We know from the research that a vast majority of men who end up in prison are often in single parent homes with their mother and have very, very intermittent male role models, essentially, don't we? Yeah, and I think there are a lot of women who do an absolutely incredible job as Mm. being um, single parents mothers and raise very respectful children. So to me, it's kind of like putting a call out to men as fathers to think about how can men improve father? I mean, I still yes. think there's lots of attitudes out there that sort of say that, you know, women as mothers are responsible for sort of meeting all the social, emotional needs of children. I think that is changing. Yeah, I think that's absolutely changing and that's fantastic. You're listening to the Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Dr. Sue Hewitt-Bell, Senior Lecturer at the University of Sydney and a recognised leader in domestic and family violence research. 
I wanted to talk about what you mean when you talk about hegemonic masculinity and what that means. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I guess that, you know, comes out of the work of lots of experts in the gender studies area. So, you know, when you look at um, Raywin Connell's work, using that term hegemonic masculinity to kind of define, you know, a particular form of masculinity. I mean, I think that those sort of experts in gender studies have been so influential in enabling conversations and spaces to be opened up about seeing gender as a performance. And if it is a performance, then you make some choices about how you want to be as a man or a woman. So kind of moving away from that idea I suppose Simone de Beauvoir, you know, that really famous statement that she made about, you know, one is not born a woman, one becomes a woman. So it's really trying to kind of extricate notions of your gender as being a biologically determined thing and move into thinking about what are all the sort of social forces that influence the performance of gender. I was interested in this because I was really interested in your work where you talked about And I think this is what I see as well, that a lot of the work around domestic violence and the services sort of come from the perspective of a a sort of a proto-feminist sociocentric perspective, which is around sociological influences. And I think you were calling for the merger between those sort of sociological systems and the psychological ones as well, in terms of explaining the dynamics that occur within a family violence situation. Yeah, look, I personally think this is a really complex issue, and maybe what is actually needed is more people coming together with expertise than going into really, you know, disparate camps and not being willing to speak to each other, you know? I think that psychologists, they've got a lot to offer. Social workers have a lot to offer. Gender studies people have a lot to offer. I think it's communities of practice where people are getting together and they're sharing their ideas and they're thinking about this really needs a multi-pronged approach. So to me, it's kind of like all hands on board. Take the best ideas from a range of places and try to work together on remedying this epidemic. Yeah, because when I talk to domestic violence workers, the most common thing that's talked about is the power and control wheel. But we rarely ask ourselves, or it seems to me we rarely take the space to say, why do they want control? Yeah, look, I think it's a good question. And I really like some of the work of some people in the U.S. who have developed a thing called the cultural context model, where they actually use the power and control wheel, but they use it kind of from an intersectional feminist perspective. So they say that, yes, gender is a primary driver. And so we do need to work sociologically about how do we change people's attitudes about their performance of gender. But they also sort of talk about how there are intersecting forms of oppression that we also have to think about. So the long-standing effects of colonization don't just disappear. So it's really important that we actually think about for an Aboriginal man who's using violence and control Yes, that is something to do with their attitudes of entitlement that is associated with their idea of who they are as a man. But, you know, to deny the fact that there's um, a really long legacy of perhaps intergenerational trauma um, would be really counterproductive. So that's why I think a multidisciplinary approach is really important. I think that is important. You've talked about that in your work, just about the complexity of taking this on in terms of class, socioeconomic status. There's a myriad of facts in terms of drug use. History, so history of colonisation is is an important one because it has effects intergenerationally. But at a personal level, I was glad that you were talking about the kind of looking to being a good father because that was always my perspective, sort of intuitively. What do you want to raise your children with and and how would your mother feel about that and that sort of thing with men who are open to that space? Absolutely. I think that somebody who's trying to change those kinds of long-held beliefs and attitudes and behaviours probably needs a raft of professionals with expertise to think about how we make those changes because, as you said, they often come also with substance misuse issues, They might come with their own mental health issues. So, again, it just highlights that there really has to be a multidisciplinary approach to trying to change this. 
And I'd be interested to see what you thought about this. Speaking to men that perpetrated violence, speaking to women who were victims and survivors of domestic violence. But one of the first things that I felt and I encountered with when I was talking to people was all about attachment and what people would call love. I know when I talk to housing services workers, we talk about women escaping violence and they talk about their partners and the constraints. And there's certainly lots of people where I've talked to people about my fear for them and me wanting them to leave because it seems so dangerous. But there is a space when you talk to people where they talk about their attachment to their partner, the person that they've had children with. And in some cases where they talk about, even in situations that we would think were abhorrent, this feeling of attachment or love towards their partner. And I think that's what frightens people. Yeah, look, I think that people who exert power and control, use course of control in their relationships, they've got myriad things that they need to work on and change. So for me, I think a good starting point is to begin with kind of unpacking what are their attitudes and beliefs that kind of hold their sense of entitlement to behave that way in the first instance. But I don't deny that they probably also need to do a lot of work on what are their ideas about relationships and how do they feel secure. I think that those may be things a man needs to work on as well. There are equal numbers of women who have had insecure attachment relationships with their primary caregivers and it doesn't translate into stalking, strangling, denying them access to buy baby food and nappies. So I think that people make choices around how they want to behave and how they want to relate with others. So, you know, it's also curious that men who use violence against their intimate partners or control their intimate partners will say that I just lost it or I control, you know, a certain proportion of them will say that. But most of the men that I interviewed in my PhD were actually more refreshingly clear than professionals that I speak to about their use of violence. You know, they just said, I use it because it works. I don't use it at work and I wouldn't use it on the streets. I wouldn't act that way to my mates at footy, but it does work in my house. And one man spoke to me who was a police officer and he just kind of said, I don't like to have these really long protracted discussions and negotiations. I like to get my own way. And there's a quick way to do that. And there's a long way to do that. And so, you know, to me, it was actually quite refreshing. I think sometimes professionals get really wound up in making really yeah. Well, uh, explanation that I always think that as a professional, we really have to sit back and think, is this explanation yeah. that I'm giving this man for his behavior, is it actually encouraging him to change his behavior mm. or does it actually help to kind of perpetuate it? A lot of the men that I've spoken to actually felt the sense of guilt and shame wasn't yes. something that they talked about. They sort of felt quite justified. They said things to me like, she knows that if she yes. shut up, none of this would have happened. To me, it's much more instrumental, and it's about using um, your power and control and making a choice to do that. And there are some times that, you know, somebody, family members or friends can be in the house. He can feel tense. He can feel his tension rising. But he knows it's not going to be socially acceptable to grab her by the throat and throw her up against a wall. So to me, they do have much more of a sense of control over this behavior. And I think if we keep giving men who use violence excuses, then we're not on a road to trying to change anything. Do you think the conversation we're having is giving them excuses? I think that there are lots of theories out yes. there about domestic violence that absolutely do give them right. um, excuses. So I think I wish that we could just remove this word triggering from yes. the vocabulary. So I hear it lots among students learning to become professionals at university and it's almost a sense of there's this inevitable mm. causal effect between, yes. you know, you do X, you'll be triggered into mm. Y. I think that we have a lot of that in our language. So I think, you know, from a young age, it's about trying to teach people about, you know, take responsibility for your behavior. I really do think a lot of the things that we learn at kindergarten are a pretty good template to continue on in your life. I think up until the 90s, uh, sexual assault within marriage, that was the only time that became decriminalized. Yes, it's a pretty recent thing that rape in marriage is a crime. Yeah. So I think you can look at that in terms of what sorts of sentences are given out. You can speak to women who talk about their experiences with the police and it's almost like a lot of women that I speak to, either like it's very binary. Either yes. they had the most amazing experience with police officers or the most atrocious experience. So, 
I think that there are still lots of societal institutions of power that are still really struggling with being able to respond adequately. Yeah. Another thing that I think is that we spend a lot of time thinking about victims of domestic violence and thinking about, you know, safety is the be all and end all. And I think that is true. We do have to look at safety, obviously. But I think we also have to sort of look beyond safety about freedom. You know, I think coercive control there, Evan Stark in the U.S. kind of writes about how until we start to shift and see coercive control as a crime against freedom and a liberty crime, that will be a really important move forward, I think. I think yes. we, we have so many systems that are really just about incident-based. They're about responding to creating this kind of immediate safety But I, I think that women deserve more than that. Mm. I think women and children also deserve services that also think about, you know, their ongoing welfare and well-being and how do they become the full people that they want to be. I think that's important. So there's so much work, isn't there, that needs to be done in terms of changing attitudes. And I think, really, I do think that until men and women are fully represented in all aspects of the community and women are seen absolutely as equals to men and respected. I mean, look at the treatment of Julia Gillard when she was prime minister. You know, if that wasn't brought into stark relief that this is still a very patriarchal, sexist establishment that women are and men are living in. Yeah, so it's no surprise to me. Yeah. Uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of equality for men and women. You're listening to the Deep Trouble podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Dr. Sue Hewitt Bell, senior lecturer at the University of Sydney and a recognised leader in domestic and family violence research. I know in terms of the, the main domestic violence service in Victoria, I'm not sure what it is, it, at a federal level, it's a centre for non violence. But I wondered if you thought we could ever envisage a society where there was an end to violence, all violence. I mean, I'd like to think that we could move constantly. I think there's lots of people, yourself probably included, that you know are trying to work towards reducing violence. I, I can't see in my lifetime that that's ever going to be eradicated fully, but I think that's not a reason to not try. Mm. We all need to take some responsibility. I think some of those campaigns that existed around child protection, trying to get people to sort of think, you know, child protection is everybody's business. I think trying to prevent domestic violence is everybody's business. So I think it's also about, you know, how do we try to encourage really like effective bystander behavior? The incredible bravery of that 14-year-old boy the other day who got off, I think he was on a bus or something, but he intervened in a situation where he saw an adult male assaulting a female. I mean, I'm not recommending that young people insert themselves into potentially violent situations like that. I think there's some real danger issues there. But I mean, that speaks to me that says someone's taught that kid well to think about standing up for people who are being oppressed in society and actually trying to be an effective bystander around that. So I have hope we're moving towards having less tolerance for domestic violence, but do I think that we'll ever be completely violence-free? I can't see that. It seems that, that society seems to value violence at some level. We have it for entertainment. Yeah. Absolutely. And we have the necessity of military. Uh, so that, that the whole premise of that organization is around using controlled violence for protection. Absolutely. And I think like when you say that it's for entertainment, you know, I, I spoke to a journalist last year and she did an experiment with herself where she tried to for x number of months not watch anything on tv that contained violence against women and she had a very difficult time i think in the end she found one program frankie and gracie or something she found one program that actually did not contain regular content you know, she looked at the number of, um, you know, in a program that's so popular, Game of Thrones, she actually had some figures around how many rape scenes of women are in that, how many women are killed. You know, so it is at that level, it is part of this sort of sociological normalization of violence against women. 
When I read your research, the qualitative interviews that you did where you were looking at men who had this sort of low identification with themselves with this would be called in popular culture sort of toxic masculinity, the hegemonic masculinity, but also had a high need for control. They often saw themselves as saving their partners. And this reminded me of the work of Jane Campion because she quite often linked the ideas of romance and Western romance with violence from men. I thought yeah. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I did find that really interesting because I think those men really saw themselves as sort of martyrs. They really yes. talked about how they felt. They specifically would say, like, I would punch her in the face specifically to kind of like bring her back to reality because I felt that she was sort of, you know, going off in another tangent. It also came across when they had partners who had substance misuse issues. And I might add that many of their partners had substance misuse issues directly Mm. related to the violence that they were subjected to. So it was kind of like a way of self-medicating and getting through the day. But in those instances, those men who kind of felt that they were very martyrs often talked about how God would hold her hostage or Mm. I would do things against her will to try to, you know, force abstinence upon her and So it was definitely a proportion. So to me, like at the end of the day, I guess that's another thing that I think we get wrong. I think that we do tend to see in the child protection sphere, we lump all perpetrators of domestic violence together. I think sometimes that happens and there's a kind of, you know, one size fits all response. But what I felt from my research was that all of those men were very harmful to children, but we need a really subtle, nuanced assessment of their parenting because they were harmful in different ways. Some men were highly harmful because of neglect, whereas other men were very harmful because of the kind of chronic, frequent physical abuse of children. And I think sometimes that doesn't get picked up because we don't tend to work with men as much as we should. Mm. And so... It's harder, Again, we, isn't it, in terms of engagement and... Yes, that's yeah. right. So I, I often hear from child protection workers, they'll say, well, I can't engage with him because he's at work and he doesn't get home until 5.30. But at the same time, most statutory child protection workers are on sort of flexi time and they would have the capacity to go out after hours and interview a man. And I don't think mm. that they wouldn't interview a woman if she wasn't home until 5.30, if she was allegedly physically abusing her children. Things in child protection are definitely improving. Like, I do think that lots of workers are trying to shift this kind of gender bias in practice. Well, do they perceive it as a safety issue for the worker, though, as well? Yeah, I think Hmm. so. And when you look at, you know, the vast majority of child protection workers are female. It's fairly confronting. I mean... Yeah, very confronting. So, But I think that really speaks to the issues. If the professional is too scared to go and sit with this person for an hour and interview them, then how can it possibly be safe for small children and their partner to live in a kind of landscape of fear and terror? Yeah, I mean, that that's the frightening thing. I think, I mean, I felt that myself. Yeah. You're listening to The Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Dr. Sue Hewitt-Bell, Senior Lecturer at the University of Sydney and a recognised leader in domestic and family violence research. Probably the last thing, and you've talked about the feminist ideology which drives important language change such as the use of the word survivor to describe women escaping domestic violence. And I was looking at it from a psychological perspective and I was talking to some mental health social workers and things like that. And in the space of therapy, there's more of a curiosity and interest in the experience of the women themselves, yeah. if that makes sense. In terms of yeah. you would view them as somebody with... Tremendous amounts of strength in terms of particularly if they're staying and they're having to develop a safety plan. And I think everyone's hoping that if it's a very volatile and dangerous situation that that they are going to leave. But it's sort of this interesting space of sitting with the person as they come to you with whatever they come to you with, with guilt, with shame, with whatever else. And I wondered whether that was something that was important to acknowledge the experience of the person themselves, the woman themselves. Yeah, look, I totally agree. I mean, I really struggle with terminology. I think language is so 
critically important, and I totally get what you're saying. It can be a bit easy just to say survivor, but that person mm. might not actually feel like in that moment their identification yeah. at particular times might be more, I'm feeling more victimized mm. here. So I think it's important for us as professionals not to think that we're the experts, but to actually really believe in that sort of feminist principle that, no, the woman who's living that situation, she's the expert in her life. And ask her what she wants to be called. Ask her how she wants professionals to refer to her. I think we can live really multiple identities and have a myriad of feelings that sometimes might even sit in contradiction to each other. So I think, you know, on a particular day, she might be feeling more strong and as a survivor. And, you know, but I think it is really important for us to be led by women. I think we want to believe we're the expert here mm. and we've got all the answers. You know, we come from a good place. I think we want to rush in and fix everything. But it has to be slow and walking along with that person. Mm. They've got to be the person that's in control of what's happening I think sometimes if you look at, there was a really tragic murder of a woman, Tara Costigan, in, in Canberra some years ago, and professionals ran in and kind of really encouraged her to get an AVO and didn't really talk to her at all, I don't think, about how do you think he might react to the AVO, and there was no safety planning around that or consideration around that. And she was another woman who was murdered by her partner while she was holding her infant in her hands. Brutal murder. He killed her with an axe. And I think, I mean, that's on him. He's responsible for that. So I'm not at all saying that the professionals are responsible for that outcome. But I just wonder if we had walked alongside of her, investigated further, how do you think, how might he react? I think sometimes we just want to fix it. We want to fix it because it's so terrible. It was sort of what I touched on before, but sitting with someone who's in grief and loss and pain and sitting with that, but also there are the terrifying elements to it as well, the attachment and, and the things that kind of scare us as well. And I, and I think that is the period that we have to be careful of because we know that the most dangerous period is when women leave. Exactly. So when women leave and when women are pregnant, I think we really need to be letting them advise us about what they think is going to be helpful and letting us kind of be partnering them. I think this kind of work, there's a really great social worker in New South Wales, Mary Jo McVeigh, yes. at Cara House, and she really talks about how this work really brings us into questioning what's our relationship with suffering and are we actually able to sit with the discomfort of knowing that somebody might be going home and be experiencing further abuse. And how do we sit with that? I think, you know, she makes an excellent point. Because it can torment you. Yeah. yeah. It can haunt you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My partner worked uh, as a children's counselor with women uh, and children who'd left domestic violence situations. And she told me the research, oh, wow. the research showed that the men who were the most dangerous and this reminded me of what I'd read about Rowan Baxter, who had not had any evidence of a history of physical violence, but who had high levels of coercive control. And that really terrified me. Yeah. And to me, you know, I sort of felt in my research that I would like to do further research to test out this hypothesis. But it felt to me that the men that I interviewed who were really high hegemonic masculinity with high levels of control, to me, they felt like that subgroup of batterers who might proceed to kill their partner at separation, for example, because it felt like in their accounts of their lives and their fathering, it sounded like there was so much was invested in portraying themselves to the community as this perfect father, having this perfect family and this perfect wife. It seemed like so much of their sort of sense of who they were was tied up in that really narrow construction of how mm. everybody in the family had to behave. Mm. Yeah. I remember someone saying to me about generational poverty when I worked in family work. They were saying that children aren't just your children. They're almost like losing your children. It, it's almost more because they're everything that you have. So, yeah. and, and I sort of see this sort of loss of sense of self 
everyone loves their children to some extent, uh, unless, of course, there's personality disorders and things like that. In, yeah, whereas uh, to me, it felt more like it wasn't so much about, I love my children so much, I want the very best for no. my children. It was like, I love what I portray mm. of myself, and it's about my ego, and if my needs aren't met, well, one man sort of yeah. said to me, you know, well, fuck them. I mean, I guess it highlights that I think that men who use violence and control, they're diverse. Some do have very serious mental health issues. Some mm. are sociopathic. Mm. You know, so I think that's why I think it's important that there's like a range of responses because they have often complex issues yeah. that are intersecting. That's what I liked about your work because it was looking at a heterogeneous population and my feeling around it was you are seeing personality disorders, people with ABIs, and you're really having to make an assessment around how you deal with each and every individual subgroup. Yeah, yeah. And to me, the major driver is gender. Yes. <laughs> so regardless of whether or not someone has a mental health issue, mm. to me, I still think it's important that in that multidisciplinary space, someone is really tackling how is it that you've come to formulate the idea that it's okay for you to do this to women. It's okay for you to do this to children because you're not doing this to men. So how do you have control of that behavior when you're in a disagreement with a man. So I still think that gender is really important, but yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a range of complexities and people are yeah. complicated. It's impossible to ignore gender in this, obviously. Yeah. And then I think that there are those other sort of the psychological issues, the personality, the attachment, mm. how relationships function, that sort of thing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That was just so interesting. You made me feel comfortable and I felt like I just started talking to you in a conversation. So it was actually kind of fun. Yeah, it was really, really good. And so there you heard Dr. Mark Halloran conversation with Dr. Susan Ewart bell Susan talks about you know, maybe men should take responsibility for providing that education or direction to men who have been referred by various programs. But I don't know whether men like that who resort to physical violence against women would even be interested in listening to other men. These kind of men they have a whole range of problems, you know. They could be economic, they could be mental health problems, and you just wonder how they can be reached to change their behaviour. Well, I think she talked about different cohorts of men, you know, from her research, and that it is a heterogeneous group, men who perpetrate domestic violence. And we also talked about the men who would be most likely to respond to men's behaviour change programs. Um, mm. So there is a certain profile of men who I would say would probably be closer to antisocial and sociopathic type of personality that would possibly not respond very well to men's behaviour change. In fact, they screen for antisocial personality disorder in prisons and, and tried and they're supposed to remove those men from groups because they can act as sort of a contagion, if that makes sense. I was very interested in Susan's comment. I'll quote it. She was talking about professionals, and I think she might have been talking about psychologists, Mark. Is this explanation that I'm giving this man for his behaviour, is it actually encouraging him to change his behaviour, or does it actually help to kind of perpetuate it there's a few differences in terms of the approach, and I think that's why I liked Susan's article was the call to collaborate more. So from her discipline, it tends to take more of a sociological perspective in terms of a culture, you know, toxic masculinity. I think the question was asked in the interview, why is it an asymmetrical relationship between men perpetrating violence on women? And I think we can simply look at classifications in terms of disorders. Men predominantly make up the classification of antisocial personality disorder and tend to externalise violence, whereas women predominantly represented in things like borderline personality disorder, 
And so it goes along with high levels of aggression from men. And I think we have to be realistic around this in terms of that we're not making excuses when we look at every potential variable, you know, that there are some things that are explained culturally, but we also need to look at things not only from a sociological perspective, but from a psychological perspective, from a biological perspective. I've seen women perpetrate lots of the coercive control behaviours that men perpetrate within domestic violence relationships, within practice. The difference between men and women is that men tend to be physically more aggressive and they tend to be stronger because they're biologically different to women. And if they are able to inflict damage, if women are physically violent towards men, they're less likely to inflict serious damage. And I think we have to be clear about being quite honest about that. So there's a difference in the way that aggression is expressed. And I think there are lots of explanations around that. And I don't think that you're making excuses by saying that there is a social, there is a psychological, there is a cultural, there's a biological basis for that. You know, in some ways, you know, people might say, oh, well, you're kind of excusing men because they're men. But I'm going to be specific. Mm. Susan acknowledges the pressure to excuse Indigenous men because we should accept that they've inherited a long history of colonisation. Well, no, see, I think the point is that when you're looking at every factor, right, and this, this will come up again and again with some of these interviews. I've been thinking about this a lot. When you're looking at all these factors, it is not about making excuses. It is because we are looking for the way to be most effective and to solve this problem. We're not looking for a way of making excuses. We're trying to understand the problem. And so with curiosity, we're opening ourselves up to every possible discussion and conversation to try and understand this better. Everything is, is understood better by opening it up. You can just think of a family environment, the family environment where no one can speak their mind and discuss how they feel and things like that. That's not going to be conducive to people having good relationships and good communication. And it's the same thing in social discourse. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very difficult issue, isn't it, about that? As Important. Susan acknowledges, it needs a multidisciplinary yes. approach. Yes. All right, then. Okay, well, we'll move on to next week's interview yes. with Joe Huston, the Chief yes. Financial Officer of Give Directly, a very different sort of topic. He has a very interesting approach to charitable donations. Could you outline it, Mark? Give Directly is one of the organisations listed by Give Well and Peter Singer's organisation, Life You Can Save because it's uh, considered to be effective in its altruism. So Give Directly provides a version of basic universal income to villages in places like Uganda to see if this will improve things like food security and essentially just quality of life. So another important and interesting episode next week when Dr. Mark Halloran interviews Joe Huston, Chief Financial Officer of Give Directly, here on Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. This interview contained themes that some listeners may have found distressing. For anyone experiencing domestic or family violence, you can call 1-800-RESPECT for counselling or referral information. <laughs>